Blessed. Good morning. How are we doing today? Blessed. There we go. Great to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. Amen.
Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Beautiful February day. Last day of February. Make sure your gutters are clean. Because mine are not. Let's go to God in prayer. Our Father, we thank you so much, Lord, and we're just asking that you do prepare our hearts for what you have for us. Lord, we're grateful for you. We're grateful for your salvation. And we're really grateful for everybody here as, uh, as a group of, of brothers and sisters in Christ. And for those that can't be here, that maybe you're watching online, or for other reasons, or with illness, or just put your hand on them. And uh, when, when, it's, when we're able to all get back together, help us to appreciate each other that much more. And we just we give you all the honor and praise. And we're really looking forward to what you have in store. It's your name we pray. Amen. So a couple of things that I, I just mentioned cleaning your gutters. Uh, I remember, and I'm going to kind of get into a couple of current events here real quick about basically preparing your hearts or, or listening to a repeated warning. Anybody ever been repeatedly warned about something but didn't listen? Yeah, all the time. And I mentioned cleaning gutters. You know, clean your gutters. Why? I don't want to. Clean your gutters. Why? I don't want to. I like water in my basement. Yeah, I mean, there's just basic things that I remember my dad as a kid would always say, clean the terminals on your either the lawnmower or your car. I say, why? Well, then when your car doesn't start and it's in the middle of winter and it's two degrees out, you wish you'd clean your battery terminals. <laughs> and there's, there's so many more things than that. And the things my father and my mother taught me growing up is too numerous to count. Um, geez, I remember my dad would always tell me that, John, you know, if you, if you try to hide a problem, if you make a mistake, just own up to it because the cover-up is always worse. And he would give me examples of his life or, you know, my other relatives where there was a mistake made and... He would tell me, just, just own up to it, address it, and fix it. Own up to it, address it, and fix it. Well, the times I really disappointed him as a child is when I didn't tell the truth, own up to something, and fix it. And, you know, because it, and he was right. He wasn't telling me that just because, you know, just for the sake of it. He was telling me that because through all of his experience and knowledge, that the best way to do something is just to address it head on in truth and honesty and deal with it. Don't keep putting it off. Don't try to hide it. Don't try to... You know, shovel dirt on top of it, hope it goes away. You know, own up to your issues and then work on it. And the couple of current events that I'm talking about today, these are, and please hear me, these are not going to be anything political or ideological. These are just facts from what, as far as what I know. There's been a terrible tragedy in Texas recently because of a cold snap. And I would like to think that this is a once in a lifetime thing. And to this degree, they say it was a very rare instance. But what has happened is that there have been repeated warnings. Um, I, I went to Yale's Climate Connections website. There were warnings in 1983, 1989, 2003, 2006, 2008, 2010, 2011, and then this most recent one. And even in the past, at the, at then, after the 2011 cold snap, the governor was Rick Perry. He even signed legislation saying, look, fix this stuff. Make sure that our the lines and the pump stations and the natural gas and the wind and everything can handle the cold snap because this is going to happen again. Well, like what most humans do is we say, well, that's, you know, that's going to cost a lot of money, it's going to cost a lot of time, let's, let's worry about that six months from now. Well, then six months becomes a year, and a year becomes what, two years, and a year becomes two years becomes ten years. And before you know it, eventually when this thing comes around again, we're not prepared. And again, I'm not picking on Texas. Let's look at another example of Louisiana when the dams broke with Katrina, which I believe was 05. There were repeated warnings from the Army Corps of Engineers saying, look, these are basically levees in name only. They're not really going to handle a major disaster. Uh, I can think of Houston when the whole city flooded. They were building up the city and not addressing potential drainage or runoff issues. It was just concrete slab after concrete slab. So with all those issues in Texas, all the things were ignored, and then when a major cold snap came, a tragic loss of life happened, and hundreds of millions of dollars of damage to infrastructure and homes. And in the Louisiana situation, I, I looked at a few quotes back then, and there's a guy named Michael Parker, who was a congressman from Mississippi, who at the time, years before Katrina happened, was the head of the Army Corps of Engineers. And he said in 02, he said, we have to repair these levees before Katrina even happened. He said, but it has to be something done. Now listen to this. Just like our grandparents and our parents did for us, they had to create a plan for the future, and they had to not be so self-centered that they would look at nothing 
accept self-gratification on what is good for us today. Does that sound familiar? You know, what I want to do today is, you know, sit on the couch and eat nachos and watch TV. Sounds pretty awesome, doesn't it? Um, but, you know, that might not be what's best for my family if I do that every day. You know, when you just look at today what you want to do, you know, instead of getting up and going to work, instead of if, if my wife decided not to homeschool the kids, if, you know, there's so many things where you can make a decision that feels really good right now, but down the road, it could be hurting you severely. So, this is what this guy said back in 2005 after Katrina happened, but this is all from 02. So sometimes we have to be disciplined, like you know our parents taught us to be, or our grandparents taught us to be, and worry not about what feels good right now, but do the hard things so that the future is better for everybody. So I, I, unfortunately, the state of Texas is going to be reactionary, but a lot of, it, and again, kind of like the cover up is worse than just addressing it initially. If even in fact 10 years ago. These things were started to be addressed. Maybe not even a hundred percent solution, but they started, you know, protecting the pipes from the wind. Because, you know, here we get negative seven, and our natural gas is fine because we know that it's a reality, and we prepared for it. So, we got to ask ourselves: Okay, are there any warnings like this, like that was warned to the state of Texas, or this warned to Louisiana? It was warnings to the Army Corps of Engineers. We could go on and on down the list, but we could see current events where. If we're told something repeatedly and we ignore it or don't understand what the warning is, there could be dire consequences for everybody. Uh, even this current pandemic was warned about years and years ago by doctors. It's documented. They're like, look, there's going to be a global virus that comes out because of X, Y, and Z. If we're not ready for it, there's going to be problems. So we can see not every warning is correct. You're doing what I do for a living. There's people that predict all kinds of market events that never happen. So the problem is, is that we get good warnings inside of noise, right? So it's like, okay, how do I, you can, you can take any topic that you want, literally name anything you want, and you can find research on both sides of the same opinion, uh, both sides of the opinion on the same issue. So we have to learn to cut through what is just noise and what is truth. Well, thankfully, as Christians, we have a book that tells us what the truth is. It's called the Bible. So we don't have to worry about, well, is, is this person right, or is this person? If it's in the Bible, it's good. Like we don't have to worry about it. And we're lucky to live on this side of the cross. We really are, because number one, we have the grace of Jesus Christ. Number two, we have a gift of the Holy Spirit, but we also have the written word of God that, I mean, it's, it's the number one printed book, the number one most translated book in history. You know, it's hard-pressed not to get a copy of it in this country as of now. Um, but there's other countries like China where you got to smuggle them in. But the point is, we have God's word readily available. We don't even have to wonder, um, as uh, a lot of Rick Warren's a prominent pastor, he says, stop trying to listen to a voice and look for a verse. You know, we, we literally have the cliff notes to life right here. So praise the Lord for that. So we're going to stay in Matthew 16. If you have your Bibles open to Matthew 16, I'm going to go back to verses 13 through 20. So get back to where Debbie read to us at, but we're going to be going back to 13. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? So Jesus was asking his disciples. Now, the sermon title is going to make sense in a little, little bit here because he's preparing their hearts. Now, again, because we have the written word of God, we know what he's preparing them for. But imagine, and, and, and sometimes, again, because of hindsight, we can look back at biblical figures and criticize them for not getting it. But imagine, number one, being them, number two, not having the Holy Spirit. And, you know, they, they didn't know what the future held, but Jesus was gradually preparing their hearts for what was about to happen. And they said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Because we do this too, don't we? People will say, well, what do you think about this? Well, the experts say this. But, well, no, God wants to know what you feel about this. You know, we can't say that, you know, my parents were Christians, so I'm probably going to heaven. 
God's going to look at you on Judgment Day and say, what did you do with Jesus? Okay? So God has never changed. He, this, he has an individual relationship with you. He's not some mystical guy in the clouds that looks down at humanity and sniffs at him occasionally. He created you. He knows every hair in your head or in your ears or whatever. But he knows you intimately. So he's going to look at you and say, what have you done with Jesus? Okay? So again, Jesus cuts right to, the, right to the chase and says, what do you say that I am? And Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now, there's no better confession than anybody can make other than that. Jesus said, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, but for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then he strictly charged the disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ. A couple of things in there. Because of Simon's confession, Jesus changed his name. He said, you're going to be known as Peter from now on. And on this rock is what I'm going to build my church on. And then he bestowed on Peter the apostolic gifts that were given to the apostles at that time. Whatever he binds on earth is bound on earth. Whatever he binds in heaven is loosed in heaven is loosed in heaven. You get the point. But then he says, don't tell anybody yet. Now, have you ever wondered why Jesus would sometimes hinder this process when he was alive and walking on the earth? Because nobody knows the perfect time for something more than God does. And this could translate into your life, too. You could say, well, John, why hasn't my ship come in yet? Maybe your heart's not ready. So let's keep reading. Because, again, Jesus came in the fullness of time. There was no mistake about when he came and, and the order of events that happened. So Jesus methodically is preparing the hearts of his disciples, and in turn, it's going to go down the line and translate to us as well. And then this is what Jesus said, verse 21. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes, and be killed, and on the third day be raised. So was Jesus hiding this inside of a parable? No. He knew that they were pretty dense. I would have been too. Because a lot of times through scripture, Jesus had to go back and explain the parable he just told. But this is just in plain English, or plain Greek, on the original text. I am going to go to Jerusalem. I am going to be killed. And on the third day, I'm going to raise from the dead. Can it get any more plain than that? No hidden meaning, no parable, no seeking, or having to figure this out. He was, again, started to methodically prepare the hearts of his disciples. And this is what everybody likes to, <laughs> this is the guy everybody likes to kick, Peter. And Peter took him aside, this is verse 22 of Matthew 16, and, and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. Now, how would you feel? your best friend, your teacher, the man that you believe is the Son of God, if he tells you that he's going to be killed, are you going to say, okay, that's cool. You know, let's give Peter a break here. You know, he said, no, 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 look, as, as far as I'm alive or whatever I can do to stop this, I'm going to stop it. But again, Jesus allowed this to happen because he was preparing their hearts. Because look at what Jesus got, to, look at the lesson he got to teach him and as we know through history, it didn't quite sink in. So again, your, your sanctification, your walk as a Christian, I know God can do the miraculous. I know he can. But sometimes he brings you along slowly. And you're going to be able to look back and say, wow, I understand why this happened. I understand why this happened. I understand why this happened. But this is what Jesus said. But he turned to Peter and said, get behind me, Satan. Now, what did he just say previous to this? He changed his name and said, on this rock, I'm going to build my church. And not that long later, he's looking at, G at Peter and say, uh, telling him that he's under the influence of Satan's suggestions. Is Peter Satan? No. Satan is a created being. He's, a, he's his own person. And by the way, he's a defeated foe. In the name of Jesus, he's nothing. Okay? But he looks at him and says, 
you have your heart set on what? You're setting your mind on the things of man, things that make sense to us, which is don't let your best friend and teacher get murdered, right? I mean, to me, that makes sense, is what Peter said. I would have probably had the same reaction. Like, whoa, no, slow down here. But Jesus told him, you're setting your mind on the things of man and not the things of God. Because what, why would, why did Jesus come down in human form anyway to begin with? To be made a sacrifice for us. Jesus never got off a mission. And as people, as created beings, you know, these, these gentlemen didn't get it. And I, you know, I, I understand. So Peter did what most of us did. And then Jesus recognized that, look, the type of influence that Peter was under is the things of men's hearts and not the things of God. Because, you know, like we say a lot, what, what does the world think about the things of God? It's foolishness. Like the Greeks thought it was just completely ridiculous. After Jesus died, the Jewish people, the leaders of the day, saw it as a problem, as a threat to their power hold that they had. They had a theocracy in certain areas back then before Rome took over. And the world doesn't like what God has to say. It really doesn't. So, you know, the influence of Satan. You know, Peter thought he was doing the right thing. And how many of us today, how many, how, what can we see in society where people think they're doing the nice and right thing? But really, it's not from God. So, I mean, sin is deceptive. You know, the first sin ever, you know, Eve was told, hey, you know, this could make you like God. This isn't bad. It wasn't like he said, here, pick up this rock and, you know, kill your husband with it because he's annoying. It was, here, just eat this piece of fruit and it will make you better. So in today's society, they'll look at you and say, hey, you're a terrible person if you believe in the sanctity of marriage or if you believe in the way God designed us to be. If you believe that, you're a terrible person. I mean, sin has never changed. It's the same message. So, I, I don't want to say strike one, because this was the first time in the book of Matthew that it records that Jesus told, flat out told his disciples, I'm going to go to Jerusalem, I'm going to be killed, I'm going to be raised on the third day. So, like my dad telling me, me for the first time, John, don't cover up when you screw something up. Don't lie to me, just tell me the truth. Okay, so that was the first one. Well, let's stay in the book of Matthew. Let's jump over to Matthew 17. Now what's really interesting is at the beginning of Matthew 17, there is a huge miracle that happens. And just to kind of back up a little bit, before we, when, G, when Peter confessed that Jesus was the Christ, Jesus just fed 4,000 people before that, before miracles. The Pharisees and Sadducees were demanding that Jesus show another sign. Um, you know, so there was a lot of miraculous things. So there's these events that Jesus did, these miracles, and then he would say, hey, by the way, I'm going to be crucified and I'm going to raise on the third day. So you would think there would be a tension grabbing, attention grabbing things in these guys' lives that when Jesus said something just plain and simple, that they would believe what he said. Well, let's keep going here. In, verse, in chapter 17, we're talking about the transfiguration. Now, the transfiguration was just a, an amazing, miraculous event. And he took with him, this, this is the beginning of chapter 17, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, who was his brother. So there's three guys with Jesus, and he took them up onto a high mountain by themselves. So there's it's Jesus, his brother John, and Peter and James. So this is a select group of people right here. So you would think these gentlemen, if Jesus says, look, you, you three, come here, I'm going to show you something, that he would have their attention. And then when Jesus was transfigured, it said his face shone like the sun. Ever try to stare at the sun? Don't do it, kids. Don't stare at the sun. But if you have like a welding helmet on or something like that, even with a welding helmet on, it's not too great to look at the sun for too long of a period of time. And I remember, when, remember we had the eclipse? the solar eclipse, I had my little fancy little foil glasses, and I had to put those on, and then I sat in my car and looked through the moon roof that had another layer of protection, and I still had a hard time looking at that thing for too long. So Jesus' face shone like the sun, and his, and his clothes became white as light. What an amazing sight that had to be. 
just things we can't, you know, remember the first thing God created when he, he said in his creation, we, he said, let there be light. So it's just, a, it's just such a powerful image there. And then next to Jesus, there appeared to them Moses and Elijah, just talking with him, just face to face, talking with Jesus. And Peter said, again, Peter, he's, he's our buddy, in verse 4, 17, Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good that we are here. If you wish, I will make three tents here, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. So again, it was kind of like, you know, Peter's rock star line was right there. It's Elijah, it's Moses, it's Jesus. Like, you know, again, don't you understand where he's coming from? You think of Jesus and then your, your next two heroes that are no longer here that you'd like to see. Just standing right there in front of you. They're like, yes, you guys stay here. I'm going to keep you here. I'm going to make you a tent. We're going to have a great old time. But then what was happening was, well, I won't, I won't speak for God here. And he was still speaking, so he was probably just kind of kind of blubbering all over him. So as he was still speaking, when behold, a bright light, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my beloved son, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell on their faces, and they were terrified, rightfully so. It's the voice of God in a bright cloud saying, Listen to my son. He didn't say, listen to Elijah. He didn't say, listen to Moses. Because someone greater than Moses and Elijah was right there. He said, listen to him. So they fell on their faces. They were scared. They covered up. But Jesus came and touched them. This is verse 7 to 17. And he said, rise and have no fear. So what do you think happened when they stood up and looked? When they lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. So what an amazing lesson that God gave these men. He said, look, I know that God used these other men, Moses and Elijah, in a powerful way. But they don't even matter compared to who's right in front of me now, which is my son. This is the Savior of the world that I sent. This is who is going to rescue your, your souls from hell since the beginning of time. This is who I want you to listen to. Now what's interesting here, again, they're human beings. As they were coming down the mountain, this is verse 9, Jesus commanded them, tell no one the vision until the Son of Man is raised from the dead. Again, why did Jesus want to keep this hidden? Again, it wasn't the right time. Because the people might have been expecting, you know, I kind of wonder, okay, why was that? Well, the people may have expected this to happen again. Like maybe before, instead of Jesus being crucified, that he'd be transfigured and then all the dead saints would come back and he would establish some sort of earthly kingdom that the Jews are still really looking for today. The Orthodox Jews that still believe there's a Messiah coming. And even the apostles felt that way as Jesus was being arrested. Remember, Jesus had to tell them, look, my kingdom isn't of this world. If it was, there would be a big, maybe a transfiguration event. And maybe I would start some kingdom or erect a big temple in, in Jerusalem. That, that wasn't the plan. So, Jesus says, look guys, just keep this quiet until I'm raised from the dead. And the disciples asked him then, then what did the scribes say that first Elijah, now why did the scribes say that first Elijah must come? I underline that because it seems like the disciples completely bleeped over the whole thing that Jesus had to die again, didn't they? It's almost like when you're talking to somebody that has a hard time paying attention, you're like, this is really important, but yeah, what about that squirrel over there? Like they were, they were back to Elijah again, weren't they? So they got right off of Jesus as soon as God showed them biblical heroes, told them, only listen to my son. And Jesus tells them, all this stuff that just happened, wait till I'm raised from the dead. And we're back to Elijah. Right? Well, why do the scribes say Elijah first has to come? So it's like they completely just right over their head. Right? And it's, how many lessons does God tell you? It shows you, look, I'm in control, and it's right over your head. We're on to the other problem. Or, hey, I've got another question about this. We're, if, we're, we're kind of missing the main point of why we're on this earth. So again, these are people like us. We are created beings just like the apostles. So they completely missed it. But then Jesus tells them again. We're going down to uh, verse 22 of Matthew 17. As they were gathering in Galilee, Jesus said to them, The Son of Man is about to be delivered into the hands of men, 
and they will kill him, and he will be raised on the third day. And they were greatly distressed. So again, Jesus, for the second time, after a major miraculous event, says this is what is going to happen. And does he ever talk about him being killed without him saying, look, I'm going to be raised from the dead? No. Okay? He's putting a lot of work in preparing these guys' hearts. That was the second time. Now let's bump down the chapter, the book of Matthew a little bit more to Matthew 19. Now I'm going to paraphrase a little bit here. We're going to look at 16 through 30. This is the story about the rich young man. The rich young man came up to Jesus and says, Hey, what do I need to, what do I really need to do to go to heaven, to have eternal life? And Jesus said, basically gave him a laundry list of commandments. Just, and again, Jesus knows everything, so he wasn't surprised. But he's giving us an object lesson. And he's saying, okay, do this, 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 X, Y, Z, you know, and, and you should be good, right? And then the rich young ruler gets to kind of, you know, flex his muscles and say, oh, yeah, I've done that, so I'm good, right? And I love this. I used to watch Columbo reruns a lot as a kid. Peter Falk. He said, oh, there's one more thing. I wonder if they stole that from the Bible. Jesus says, okay, but there's one more thing. And this, this is when you know it's a haymaker, right? This is when it's coming. He said, if you would be perfect, go and sell what you possess and give it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. When the young man heard this, did he run out and sell everything he had? No. No. Sadly, he didn't. When he heard this, he went away sorrowful, because he had great possessions. Now, Jesus knew what he was going to do. That's why he did the, oh, and there's one more thing. What he was able to do was give his disciples, because then immediately the next verse it says he turned to his disciples and said it. So he allowed this to happen as an object lesson to his, his followers. He said, Truly I say to you, only with difficulty will a rich person enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished and said, Who then can be saved? Because isn't that like us? As people to hold rich people up in high esteem. Don't we do that? Who do we want to hang out with? Who do we want to get our picture taken with? Just in general, I'm not saying everybody here in this room, but I'm saying just in general, the rich and famous. Like little kids want to be like their favorite movie star. What if they really got to know that movie star? That person doesn't even want to be them. Okay? Because remember that. The, the, the things that the devil has to offer will never bring peace, joy, love, joy, and happiness. They just won't. They can't, because it's not from God. So then Jesus went down to, to go on and say, you know, the many in the, in the last verse of that chapter, chapter uh, 19, Jesus says, but many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. So Jesus allowed this to happen, to say, look, you can't earn your way into heaven. I mean, it, it, this is an amazing object lesson that we should all pay attention to today. That people, the reason that he says it's so hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven is to be really, truly great at something, your life has to be all consumed by it, doesn't it? So for the, like someone like Jeff Bezos, who owns Amazon, he just stepped down as CEO, but you know, the, the center's going right up there. Done a lot of things, created lots of jobs, done lots of things, but he wouldn't get to where he's at if his whole life didn't revolve around making money. Uh, if after Tom Brady won his seventh Super Bowl ring, did, did, has anybody read the articles about what his day is structured like? From the time he wakes up in the morning until he spends about an hour with his kids before he goes to bed, it's football. Whether it's strength training, his personal chef making him his food, um, and watching film, his whole life is devoted to winning Super Bowls. And it works, right? The guy's been in 10 of them. So the last, ever since he's been in the league, every other year, Tom Brady's face has been in the Super Bowl. And he's won seven of them. So you can't argue with the results, right? But as Christians, what should our focus be? The kingdom of God. Imagine if we woke up every day with a mission of advancing the kingdom of God at any cost. Again, God, Jesus keeps telling us these things, and 
We've got to make sure that we catch it. Okay, moving on. Jesus is going to tell his disciples about his death, burial, and resurrection a third time. This is Matthew 20. We're going to be in verse 17. As Jesus was going up to Jerusalem, he took the twelve disciples aside, and on the way he said to them, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and scribes, and they will condemn him to death, and deliver him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified, and he will be raised on the third day. That's the third time. How descriptive of what was going to happen is this verse right here. He laid the whole process out to him. Did he leave anything to chance? Or did he was he vague at all in that verse? He even talked about being delivered over to the Gentiles. And then after that, here's another object lesson. The mother of the sons of Zebedee came up with her sons, kneeling before him, and she asked him for something. He said, okay, what do you want? She said, here's my boys. When you come into your kingdom. So she had the foresight to know that Jesus is in charge of the kingdom of God. He said, can one sit at your right and one sit at your left when you come into your glory of your kingdom? So she knew that Jesus had power and authority. And she said, here's my boys. Can they go to the front of the line? And then Jesus gets a chance to do another object lesson. Verse 22 of Matthew 20. He says, you do not know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I am to drink? And they said to him, we are able. You know, they were ready, weren't they? They were, they were going to man up and, and they're capable of dealing with what Jesus had to deal with. He said to them, you will drink my cup, but, but to sit at my right hand and at my left is not mine to grant, but it's for those for whom it has been prepared for my, by my father. And when the ten heard it, they were indignant with the two brothers. But Jesus called them and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. So there's, you know, there's a hierarchy. Now, listen to this lesson here. It shall not be so among you, but whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be your slave. Even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Now, I, I kind of wanted to draw attention to some obvious things that Jesus said. He told his disciples three times that he was going to die, and in three days he was going to raise from the dead. But that wasn't the only thing he was talking about. See, you know, we know, we know that happened. But is there anything in there for us that's prepackaged around these very clear warnings that we know are true? So what can we pull from this? Well, the first instance in Matthew is right after. He told his disciples right after that Peter confessed that he was the Christ. Major, major watershed moment in history. And Jesus said, look, it wasn't you didn't think of this on your own. My father in heaven revealed it to you. Changed his name. Said what was going to happen from that point on. But what did Jesus say after that passage? He said, look, you guys have to be willing. He said, if anybody is willing to follow me, they must deny themselves, pick up their cross, and follow me. So Jesus said, here's this amazing truth. I am going to be killed and raised from the dead on the third day. And you need to be willing to drop everything and follow me. Then after the second time, it was right after the transfiguration. Uh, after the transfiguration, before he revealed himself, he revealed his plan to his disciples again. There was a boy that was healed from a demon. Just powerful events all surrounding this. And in the middle of these amazing, miraculous events, he drops this truth on them. And then after that, the, the disciples are arguing in, in chapter 18 about who's the greatest. They're, they're saying, who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And he, and he called them, he, he, this is when Jesus brought a child over. And he said, truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. That was around the second time. 
right after the transfiguration. Then the third time that Jesus predicted his death, burial, resurrection on the cross, it was after the rich young ruler, who society would say is somebody to be honored and respected. Jesus said, not in the kingdom of God. And then right after that, what happened? A mother brought, you know, one, her, a mom came, grabbed her boys, two of the, the, the disciples, and said, hey, can these guys be prominent with you when you come into your kingdom? And he said, if you want to be prominent in my kingdom, you need a servant. So these obvious truths that we know happen and that are the basis of our salvation, our reconciliation, Jesus' substitutional sacrifice on the cross for our sins, we know these things are to be true, but what did he put all around them? Lessons about how we are supposed to live our lives and feel about what's all around us. And I'm, I'm doing this lesson here because we're coming up to Easter. He said next month is, you know, tomorrow is March 1st. So I, I want us as a congregation to prepare our hearts for, you know, what this amazing gift was that happened on Easter. But then also, okay, that's wonderful, but as a saved person, and if you're not saved, you need to get saved. And only Jesus is the way to get to heaven. But as a saved person, okay, now what? What is God preparing your heart to do in life? Is he preparing your heart to get up, go to work, make as much money as you can, put it in a retirement account, sit on it, and just vacation the rest of your life? Those things sound fun, but is that the mission? Is that why God put you here? And is that why God bought you with the price of his own son? Is that why we're here? Like, why doesn't God just take us up into heaven and share your fire right now? We have a job to do, don't we? So, are we willing to sacrifice our eternity with Christ and God the Father and the Holy Spirit in heaven just for the pleasures and the trappings of this life that we have right now? Is that something that we're willing to trade? I remember as a kid, there was a neighborhood kid that basically swindled me out of my favorite Transformer. Any kids know what Transformers are? Yeah, well, they were around when I was young. So, <laughs> you know, there's nothing new. G.I. Joes are even older than that. But, and so Ninja Turtles were when I was a little two kid, so, you know, they're not new. They're a classic at this point. But there was, I had this transformer that my great-grandfather, his name was John Evans, he got for me. And it was a helicopter that turned into a robot. It was awesome. But there was a, there was a kid in the neighborhood that basically sold me a bill of goods and traded me for something that was worth like two bucks. And told me how great it was. I mean, he should have been in sales. He told me how great it was and you know, what you could do with it. And my brother pulled me aside and just took me to task afterwards. He said, John, you got ripped off, and now you have nothing to remember your great-grandfather over. My brother's two years older than me. I was probably 10, and he was 12. And he just read me the riot act for that. What's more important than losing your favorite transformer and getting ripped off is letting Satan rip you off. For eternity. He's going to lie to you and tell you that if you want to be a good person, you ignore what the Bible says. He's going to lie and tell you that, I mean, there's something in, in pop culture right now called cancel culture. Anybody know what that is? Where if you don't agree with what Satan has to say about the world and how we're supposed to live, you'll lose your job. There's something called doxing, where people will take people's personal names and addresses and post it on the internet. So if you say something that the, the angry mobs don't agree with, they'll show up at your house and harass you, put you and your family in danger. The only way that that happens to you, that I know of, that I've ever seen, is if you hold to a biblical standard of truth. Is that a coincidence? No, it's not a coincidence. In fact, it's further confirmation that we're following the truth because, again, the Bible is wrong. If the Bible said, look, if you do what I say, you're going to be prosperous all the time. You're never going to have any pain and misery. The world's going to bow down to your feet. If that's what the Bible said, it's wrong, isn't it? But just like everything Jesus said, it was so counterculture. He said, people are going to hate you because of me. You think people hate Christians today? I, I could literally stand up here and just read a chapter of the Bible, and I could get shut down and lose my job. Is that a coincidence? No. But doesn't that make you feel a little good? Because our God, our Bible's right. The Bible's never wrong. And as the longer we're on this earth, God's going to give you examples like what he did with his 
followers, hey, my word is truth. Hey, my word is right. Hey, if you're struggling with something, pick up your Bible and read it. If we pay attention to these little confirmations that happen along the way, we know that God's word is, is true. Well, praise the Lord. What, what's in God's word? That you're going to be saved and you get to spend eternity in heaven with our Savior. That God has literally created you in his image. He's called you out of a life of sin and death. He's written your book, your name in the book of life. And Satan has no power over you, and he can't do anything with you. So in the midst of all these amazing things going on, or these the, the cancel culture, people that hate the Bible, that hate God's law, people that may hate you because of God's law, remember what the Bible says. If you want to love somebody, be their servant. I think one of the hardest things to do depending on what type of person, if you're a competitive person, is to let yourself be wrong. Like, I, I gave my example of that poor little girl that shortchanged me at Annie Ann's. You know, there's going to be, there's going to be a lot of things that worse that happen to you in life. And are we willing to be like Jesus and forgive that person? So when we see these things here where Jesus is preparing the disciples' heart for, for Easter, what we're going to celebrate, look guys, I'm going to die. I'm going to be killed. But I'm going to raise on the third day. Hey guys, number two, I'm going to be, I'm going to be killed, but I'm going to raise from the dead. And then they chase a squirrel and ask another question after the transfiguration. And then the third time, look, this is literally how it's going to go down. Okay? So what's God telling you? Is he showing you something in his word, saying, look, this is what I need you to do. Or is the Holy Spirit shining a light on a personal sin that you might be struggling with? He said, look, I need you to fix this. But again, it's not going to even be your power. You just have to ask. Because all the power belongs to God. So not only is he a loving, benevolent God, despite of what goes on around us, he's also willing to help you be a better servant. The Bible never says, I'm going to help you get a bunch of stuff. What Jesus promises is, look, if you want to be great, be a servant. So if there's if there's something coming up here, like I, I was talking in the back here, you know, we're going to be starting up Sunday school again here in a couple of weeks. There'll be more, more news on that. Um, I'll be reaching out to the teachers here if I haven't already, just asking what your comfort level is and if you're ready. And there's a few things that we need ironed out, but as we start to emerge from the ashes of all this that's going on, if God's asking you to serve, telling you to serve, um, if I reach out to you, you know, if he's telling you, do it. If not, tell me, you know, because God has a certain, a, a specific, it's a hard word to say, a specific ministry for you. And don't be afraid of it, and be encouraged, and it may force you to be more of a servant than you are right now. So what's God preparing your heart to do? So pray about that. And again, the Holy Spirit will tell you what he wants you to do if you're saved. If you're a Christian, if you're not a child of God, anything goes. You can be lied to by the world. You can be lied to by Satan and familiar spirits. Things that aren't from God, you can be lied to. Make sure that you're saved, number one. That Jesus is the Lord of your life. The Bible tells us that because Jesus died, paid the penalty for our sins, conquered death, rose from the grave, because of that, we have a right to be called children of God. And the Bible says if you believe, confess with your tongue that Jesus is the Son of God, you'll be saved. So have you taken that step? If you've never taken that step, if God hasn't called you out, you know, don't let today pass by without accepting eternal life and salvation. But if you are a saved person and you've allowed, like what the, the disciples did at the Transfiguration, if we're allowing things that are distracting to distract us, from what Jesus is really trying to tell you, you ask him to kind of you know, cut through the fluff, the things out there. Again, remember, you can get a podcast for anything you want to hear, but we have the Word of God. So be hungry for the Word of God. Dig into that, because the answers are there. So what is God preparing your heart to do? And as we get closer to Easter, again, we're going to go into the triumphal you know, entry into Jerusalem and what Christ had to go through, but you know, praise the Lord on Easter Sunday, 
we're going to recount the miracle that was Jesus conquering death. And what he told his disciples he was going to do is exactly what he did. So praise the Lord for that. Um, let's go to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, just, we're just asking that you prepare our hearts. And there may have been something that you want us to do that we've been ignoring for such a long time. And Lord, as we try to get our hearts in the right place, we can be like the disciples, where you can flat out tell us, look, this is what I want for you, and we ignore it. And we ignore it, and then we forget, and then when you know, things get tough, we run scared like the disciples did. If, we, if our hearts are in that position right now, Father, prepare them to be otherwise, and give us the strength to serve, and give us the strength to care about what you care about, and give us the courage to know and the faith to know that you win. And that we know that we win because of you and because we are your children. And even if this world takes everything from us, help us to have joy to know that we have eternal life with you. And Lord, please fix our hearts through all this thing, these things that we're going through. Help us not to be afraid. Help us not to put our trust and faith in any political party or any boss at work or any job or any retirement account. Help us only to look to you for the answers and to care about what you care about. Lord, we're so grateful for all these repeated warnings that you've given us because we know that it's only through you that there's salvation and that we know that you've got a job for us to do to advance the kingdom and help us to have a joyful heart to run after that and put all of our faith and trust in you. And Lord, if there's somebody here that's not saved, please make today the day. And we're going to thank you in advance. And it's in your name we pray.
victory in Jesus. That's it. You know, there's nothing the world can give you at all that compares to the love and the, and the grace of Jesus Christ. So go today in, in boldness. Don't be afraid of what the world's going to do or what's going on around you. Just, just look at Jesus. And then we're going to celebrate what he did for us here in these next few weeks. And uh, just stay safe and look forward to seeing you guys again soon.